I'll just I'll just introduce the, the topic of existential experience and uh, as I mentioned to you the best way I can explain what it is is by saying that people with psychopathologies such as chronic depression or chronic anxiety or an ongoing experience of dissociation or schizophrenia or people with dementia their existential experience is different from the experience of normal people and I call it experience because it has qualia, it has qualities of experience. It's, it's what it's like to be depressed. There's a certain flavor to the experience uh, of that. And, um, and it's existential because it's all pervasive in terms of, it, it, it's like colors, everything in, one, in, in one's experience. And it's constantly there. So tell me a little bit about what your, what kind of your sense of your, how would you describe your existential experience? This is a very open question. And also, if you feel that your existential experience changed, let's say from when you were a kid to were there different periods in your life when you would say that uh, you had different uh, existential experiences? So, it would seem to me that there may be layers to this. That there is a deep existential experience, which is really the, the bedrock of one's sense of existence and then there's weather changes that take place uh, around it and above it okay um, and in that sense uh, from that perspective um, there certainly have been changes in my experience of myself and of life uh, through the years as I've, as I've gotten older and have had more experiences as far as that goes. Yes. But the deep bedrock experience has remained very consistent. And it's, if I examine it, which, which occasionally I do, I don't really find a great deal of difference in the actual experience between now and when I was, say, a child mm -hmm. or a teenager or at any other period in my life. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest difference is that I've developed ways of conceptualizing it and talking about it. But the, but the sense of what life is and the sense of who I am as part of that life is, is the same. So that has not changed. Um, can I can I ask you a few questions about it? Oh, absolutely! We go? Oh, please. Um, so, can you say something about the qualities of that uh, bedrock existential experience? So, um, so I I differentiate in my life between the ages of when I was born and seven and then everything that's happened yes. after seven. Yes, and the experience you had in Morocco. That's right. Yeah. And the reason I do that is because the experience I had in Morocco gave, it helped explain to me, even at the age of seven, what I'd been experiencing earlier on. So earlier on, I experienced myself as part of a part of a loving universe, a supportive universe, but one that was alive. Everything was uh, living. Uh, at least that's how I would phrase it now. Yes, I didn't phrase it that way. Yes, then, but I just had a sense that everything had an uh, an emanational presence 
and that would be the sofa, the chair, the house, the rocks, the trees. Um, everything had an emanation, and that emanation was fundamentally, I fundamentally experienced it as supportive. Um, not so I suppose in a way it would be like floating in a a very warm bath you know it's like it wasn't so much that it was supportive to me as an individuality it wasn't like uh, the tree would say oh David we're supporting you <laughs> but it was a sense of being in this field of of a, a loving and supportive life and I, I did not, I, I, I didn't try to analyze that. It just was. Mm -hmm. But there were at times experiences uh, where I would encounter a person or a place where the energy was very different. Where it was not supportive. It was actually, in some way, uh, it felt dangerous to me. Yeah. There may have been no danger, uh, but there was something off about it. Like it, it didn't, it didn't fit into this larger community of of life. Mm -hmm. But that was fairly rare, um, and I was fortunate. I grew up in a very loving household, and my my parents didn't always understand what I was experiencing. Um, I rarely tried to talk about it because I just didn't have the words for it. Sure. <laughs> but on a few occasions when I did, and I realized that they couldn't get what I was trying to describe, and I couldn't quite describe it. Did you get a sense that other people may have a different uh, kind of I, just, I didn't really think about it, to about. tell you the truth. Okay. Um, I, I think I just had the assumption that that people were experiencing what I did, but didn't talk about it. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Makes sense. Uh, but when I was seven, I had this out-of-the-body mystical experience and I experienced myself choosing to be here and being uh, coming as a spirit to incarnate. The sense of that was one of such joy, just a, uh, a joy at being here and a love for this place. And that, that um, matched gave more definition to that earlier feeling mm -hmm. of being in this supportive environment or this supportive field of life because I felt within the world a, a very deep joy of being. It wasn't just my joy, but just like if I could look deeply enough and listen deeply enough that's what I would see and hear is the world being joyous. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and it certainly, I certainly recognized uh, that in so many ways, this wasn't a particularly happy place to be, <laughs> especially, especially growing up in Morocco where uh, although my childhood was, was fairly protected, um, but occasionally we would go out, and my dad would go out because of his job into the surrounding Arab villages, and sometimes I would go with him, and, and I could ex I witness the poverty and the challenges that people were having, and, um, and certainly over the years, as I've gotten older, it, pretty apparent that there's a lot of things that go on in our world that is engaged uh, yes. suffering and, and but well, yet underneath it all it's still this sense of joy so that for me is my 
background experience. This is a, a loving and joyous place to be. And the way it was, that does for me is there are times when um, when the weather gets cloudy, stormy, mm -hmm. and I'm feeling uh, melancholy or I feel um, uh, what, what is the purpose of what I'm trying to do or does it have any effect or just, you know, all those usual kind of doubts that can arise. Mm -hmm. And then, then I just pause and I tune back into that. How do, you, how do you do that? Oh, I just, <laughs> I turn my attention back to it. Um, it's like it's, it's always there for me. It's in my body. It's in the things around me. I just, but I, I, I turn my attention to it. I don't know quite else how to describe it. Well, can you do it right now? Turn your attention to it? Oh, sure. So, well, I mean, I'm aware of it right now. Okay. I'm, but there are times when I can get quite lost in my in my head, in my feelings. Yes. And and then I it's, the feeling is that I just kind of shrink into myself, <laughs> into well, this little thing. Yes. And well, and I I don't mind that little thing. I it's very useful, but um, but sometimes it. I get to feeling when I'm in that more shrunken place, uh, I lose sight of that larger dimension. It's just, and then I just remind myself it's there. But when I remind myself of it, I'm back into that bed, bedrock experience. So can we choose if, if can we choose an instant in which you made that turned your attention onto the onto the background or the bedrock um, and, and 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 just if you could go into I, I want to get a sense of what's the internal movement that that you do in order to uh, connect so I don't, first I should say I do not have a sense of disconnection. Okay. But what I have is I'll focus on a given set of experiences. So if you wanted something specific. Um, so lately I've been, uh, I, w I went through a period um, when I was uh, had bladder cancer and I went through lots of operations and um, it ended up my my bladder is smaller than it normally would have been and it's repositioned in my body mm. <laughs> and it creates a a little bit of incontinence and, and some other issues and my kidneys are at risk. One of my kidneys is actually um, non-functioning at this point and the other one is doing okay, but you know I, I I get checked every six months to make okay. sure it's okay. Yes, sure. <laughs> so um, there are times when, uh, <coughs> and I have I've always had lung problems. I was I had lung problems when I was born. And I've uh, have had this kind of chronic asthma. So it's, it's not always easy for me to get out and exercise and do things. And I, so I, the other day I was sitting and thinking, I'm just feeling like a lump, you know, physically. Yeah. Uh, I, had, I had a bout of COVID and, and it, the fatigue stayed with me for quite a while. And, uh, and there were just days when it was just hard to do anything. Yes. <laughs> And and one morning I was sitting and, and thinking, um, I need to get up and, and, and go to work and because I have things I need to do and it just didn't 
I just didn't feel the energy to do that, and I yeah. and I sort of wasn't feeling wasn't feeling good about myself. I wasn't feeling good in my body. I just wasn't just feeling. I wouldn't exactly call it depressed, but I was out of sorts. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, all right. Uh, the reason that I'm doing all this, the reason I'm in this body, is because of that experience of the joy I felt in coming here and the love I have for this world. And so I, I looked out the window, uh, and I looked at the trees and the houses across the street, and I thought, uh, I live because I love these things. I'm here because I love these things. The world loves these things. <laughs> as soon as I think that, it all comes flooding back. Right. The sense of the joy and the love. And now, it doesn't always suddenly fill me with energy <laughs> sure. on a physical level, sure. but it, it definitely shifts what I'm experiencing in the moment shifts the weather. <laughs> yeah. And the clouds go away and and then I I feel very good about what I'm doing and, and doing it, acknowledging that I'm doing it within certain physical limits <coughs> that are that I didn't used to have when I was younger mm. because of the bladder situations and mm. all of that. Is that helpful? It's it's very helpful and it's very interesting. I'm sure I'm sure you know that a lot of spiritual traditions and spiritual masters have a very different experience from what I sense you're talking about, which is what gives them joy is a, is is being conscious. Is being conscious. Being conscious. And they don't really mind if the whole world disappears, because that consciousness is eternal and not dependent on, on anything. But I got the sense when you told the story that the joy that you feel has to do a lot with the world, with the existence of the oh, world. Very much so. Yes. That's and, right. And, and that also, tell me if I got you right, is that until the age of seven, you were, it's like you had to make a choice that you want to be in this world for, for the world, in a sense, for the existence of the world. Or there, was, there was something with a choice that you kind of mentioned of being here, which changed your relationship to, to well, being I, in the world. I experienced that choice in that ex in that mystical experience. Yes. I I wasn't experiencing that prior to that. Yes. Um, and it wasn't a choice. Well, I'm not sure. How to, I felt it was a choice I had made prior to birth. So it, it wasn't like a choice that, no, I, um, it's not exactly right. It's a choice I'm continually making as a whole being, which includes David as a personality. But because for, the thing about that experience is that it's outside of time. It's not like, you know, it was... It's beautiful. It was, you know, 70 some years ago when yes. I was 71 years ago when I was seven. Yes. It's like it's still happening. I mean, yes. it's the choice is a timeless choice as, as, as far as earthly chronology goes. <laughs> so you could say that it's not a choice that you made at that moment, but you recognize. Yes, that's right. Yes. And I'm. And, and another way of, of describing what I was saying earlier is I simply remember the choice. I tune into the choice and then 
the presence of it is very real to me. Yeah, and 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 I get a sense that what that somehow and it's very it's very unusual what what you're talking about, and I think it adds another uh, dimension to my understanding of the existential experience. Is that the element the element of choice somehow has to do with the formation of that uh, existential experience? Or, or it adds something because, as you said, there was uh, an existential experience of the goodness or the support of, of, of the world even before that experience, but something was added when you recognized the choice. Yes, it became, a, I was then participating in the choice. Um, even, even though the participation was I guess minimal when I was seven or eight, but as I've gotten older, um, it becomes a very conscious choice. I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah. I don't know how else to put it. I'm participating with, with that choice or in that choice. Yeah. No. You, <laughs> this it's it's kind of a mis it's, it's paradoxical or or I, I understand why it's like a choice I made it's a choice I'm making it's there all the time I, I'm making it but I'm just recognizing that it's kind of as a mystical experience it doesn't give itself very easily to the rational linear language this is true yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I sit at my computer for hours trying to figure out how to <laughs> yeah. explain something yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. But somehow, when you sit in front of your computer and you try to express something, you know when the expression is not exactly right. I do. And when the expression is exactly hit the point. I do. So on some level, language, we, we can find the right language yes, for it. Yes, we can. So or at that, least we can get very close to it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so... One of the things you said when you started describing the existential experience is that uh, thinking about it, paying attention to it, and speaking about it uh, added something to that. Well, it, it certainly aligns me psychologically with it. So it, it I guess you would say it brings the, the, the mystical dimension and the psychological dimension together. Um, where they can be mutually informing. Um, I know, for example, if I'm up giving a lecture or if I'm writing, I know when I'm just speaking out of my mind from things I remember or that I'm just have formulated through my thinking. And and, and in my, my language, I say it's coming from out of, my psych, out of my psyche, out of my psychology. And there's a difference between that and when I'm coming out of the wholeness of myself and I'm, and I'm speaking out of the mystical dimension as fully as out of the psychological dimension. Because there's, my friend William Irwin Thompson used to say, and David, I can tell when you go into overdrive because there's just um, there's just a different flow. There's just a um, it's like something that was mon monoral suddenly becomes uh, stereo. It's like <laughs> it fills yes. the space rather than yes just occupying a small part of the space. So I, I'm very aware of that difference. And there are, there are times when I feel it would be easier not to say anything, just to, just to be, so to speak, to hold a presence. In fact, one of my friends, William Bloom, told me once, David, you shouldn't be teaching, you should just be doing darshan. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> but 
But my particular job is to speak it and to find words and language. And because I believe that what I'm experiencing can be shared and that it's not an experience unique to me, but it's n native to everyone at some level because we're all part of that world. Mm -hmm. And I like to think I'm giving voice to what is that world. So just to do darshan and just to hold an energy, just to hold the mystical dimension isn't sufficient for me. It has to have that dimension of, of thought and, and um, articulation. So I want to ask, because you connected your ability to speak from the wholeness of your being, rather than just intellectually, to the uh, to the existential experience. How, how how is that how is that related? So, one thing that I feel, and I've always felt this as a um, as a maybe a difference in direction between myself and some more traditional spiritual uh, ways of being is that the spiritual dimension for me is very much wants to be part of the physical world. It actually doesn't see a separation, but it, it acknowledges that there is separation in that human beings have created separation. <laughs> yeah. So it very much wants to overcome that and to be very present mm. um, in everyday life, in the, in the in honoring and loving and valuing the physical dimension and our experience. So for me, the mystical dimension doesn't call me to it. It it. Rather, it it asks me to to call it uh -huh. in. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, there's the uh, this is a very funny way to put it, mm. but in the legend of the vampire, the vampire can't enter a house unless he's invited. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. And so there's something similar here that I have to invite, and I have to invite as an act of love, as an act of I don't want to say that, that it is every bit as wonderful to be in the house as to be outside it, that, that, that the, the physical world and this level of being is a spiritual dimension. We're not in exile here. <laughs> right. um, we're not cast off from or, or distanced from our sacred roots, our, our spirit. So, but we think we are. Mm -hmm. So the the invitation isn't just a mental thing. I can't just say, you know, come. But it's a heart thing too. There has to be the sense of you're my beloved. I really want you in. In and that that was my term for God all the time I was growing up was the beloved because that's how I experienced it. Mm -hmm. I experienced it as this great love that was a love for me, but also that was asking love from me in return. Yeah. And that it wasn't, it wasn't the love of a little creature for this humongous sacred uh -huh. thing. Uh -huh. It was the love between equals. Uh -huh. Um, otherwise, it's not really love. Um, so, honoring myself as, as as being that that love that is. And here's where words break down. I was going to say as being equal to the love of the sacred, but equal isn't quite right because it's not a that's makes it very quantitative. Yeah. It's just 
there's two things that are not different from each other. Um, it's a it's a kinship relationship. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that drawing on that and inviting inviting that love and that spirit into the physical domain. That seems to be what my work is. It's what, at least that's what my orientation is. That's very much part of this bedrock thing yeah. for me. I don't at all have a sense of, I want to move out of this world. I want to ascend to a higher level. I appreciate there are higher levels. I mean, there are different frequencies of life and mm. consciousness and energy and vibration and all of that. And I know from personal experience that there are some more wonderful places than this one okay. <laughs> yeah. that aren't quite so um, challenging. <laughs> yes. But um, it doesn't matter. This, this is what it is, and it offers certain gifts that no other domain or realm or dimension or whatever you want to call it can offer. Yeah. And we're there privileged to be here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even with all the bladder cancer and the, everything else.